Exactly. All right, so today we're going to look at uh, the difference between models, laws, and theories. Now, I hate to tell you this, but today's going to be one of those days where you're just going to have to listen to me yak for a while. Okay? So sit back, open your mind. You probably don't even have to take any notes, but you do sort of have to follow along a little bit. It's going to be a little challenging because it's going to be a little long. I'm going to ask you to highlight a few things, and at the end, I'm going to try to get an understanding of do you know the difference between a model, law, and theory? Can you understand what theory means? And uh, I, you should also know that scientific models change, which you probably already know. So let's begin here. I'm asking you, who wants to be brave? Who didn't look ahead and tell me, in your own words, what is a scientific model? Who wants to tell me what their version of scientific model is? Anyone? Be brave. Jason? Representation of data. Representation of data. Did we do scientific models yesterday when we created graphs? Yes. It's a bit of a stretch, <laughs> but I would grant you that. Up on the shelf there, I have a, a globe. Is that a scientific model? Yeah. Why? Yeah. It's a representation of data. It's a representation of, it's not necessarily data, but it's certainly a representation of the world, right? Can we see the whole globe up there? Yeah, you know, if you had it in your hands, you could spin around, you could look at it, right? Can we see the whole world just sort of in everyday life? Not so much. I'm getting into it a little bit too much. What is a scientific law? Who would like to volunteer? Anyone? Any brave souls out there looking for brownie points? <laughs> Something that's been proven. How many people would love to agree with that? Now that it's been said, too bad you're all wrong. But don't feel bad because almost every grade 11 class says that. That's exactly the answer I was expecting. It's my job to teach you the real reason, or the real meaning behind law. Don't feel bad, Lucas. What is a scientific theory? Now you're all, no one's going to want to say this now because they're going to be afraid that I'm going to say it wrong. Pardon me? An un no, a scientific theory is something that has not been discovered, right? Or proven. So it's, it's on its way to becoming a law? Yes. How many people would like to agree with that? It's a scientific theory is something that's on its way to becoming a law. Oh, yes. Oh, now we're not so brave. Oh, I, I have my hand up. Alex is shaking his head. Yeah. I'm not going to say right or wrong, but I am going to ask you that question later in the day. How do we prove scientific theories? Wait. Trial and, error. Trial and error, experimentation. Uh, would you also agree that it involves doing experiments that other people have done and seeing if you get the same results? Yeah. Okay, good. I'll get it. Do you believe in atoms? Hands up if you believe in atoms. There better be like everyone's hand up. Nate. Hands on up. Do you believe in atoms? Okay, oh, great. Yeah, okay. Why? Why do you believe in atoms? Why do you believe in atoms? Not generally people. Why do you, Kurt, believe in atoms? Because some wise person at the front of the room said, everything's made up of atoms, right? And you went, yeah, okay. Uh -huh. Have you ever seen an atom? No. I'm seeing lots right now. Everything's made up of them, but you've never seen and seen, seen one, have you? Can you believe in something that you haven't seen? <laughs> okay, well, just something to think about. How are science and art similar and or different? Did anybody get this far? John, did you get that far in the questions? Anyone? No? Science and art. I'll give you the easy one. How are science and art different? Come on. I like how science and art. How are science and art different? It's yes, they're spelled science. differently. That's correct. Okay. Science is all based on fact, and art is under interpretation. Excellent. If you turn in an assignment, like a physics assignment, I can grade it based on numbers and give you a mark. If you turn in some art, it's a little bit more subjective, isn't it? Right? It's there. It's an opinion kind of thing. Okay, that's how they're different. Want to say something? No? How are they the same? You have to think. You have to think. 
They both explore new ground. I've never heard that one before, but that's good. I heard patterns. Would you or would you not agree that to have a real good, to understand art, if you go down to the museum, and you see, you've probably all seen it, the government of Canada bought a big painting, and all it is is red. One million dollars, it was in the news like about 10, 15 years ago. A right? million dollars for a canvas that's nothing but red. And people stand there and go, a million bucks? Like, are you kidding me? I could have made that, right? Do you have to have an appreciation for art to really appreciate art? Yes. Kind no? Of. Kind of? It does depend on what kind of art it is. If, if you're looking at, if you or I walked into a garage sale and there was two paintings there and one was a Rembrandt and one was a Bennett, Let's say I'm not a bad amateur painter. I'm not. <laughs> I don't know. It's a calculator. That's what I painted. If there's a Bennett and there's a Rembrandt, and assuming that I'm a half decent amateur painter, can anyone in here tell the difference? Probably not. There might be the odd one or person in the class that might know something about art or might you know know a Rembrandt when they see it, but I don't. You certainly couldn't tell a, a real Rembrandt from a fake Rembrandt. I don't think there's anyone in school that could do that, right? You have to know something about art to truly appreciate it. Do you have to know something about science to truly appreciate it? Probably. I appreciate well, the fact I'm not going to be literate. <laughs> yeah, I mean, to appreciate really good science, you might have to know something about it, right? Okay, so I think there is some simil similarity there as well. Okay. <laughs> Some astronomers say the universe is expanding, some say it's shrinking, others say it remains constant or static. How can these scientists arrive at completely different conclusions when they look at the same evidence? They each have it, different theories, but they're, they're looking different. at the same evidence. Not only are they interpreting the different data differently, but what are they looking for? Jake, you need to listen. They're looking for data that does what? supports their theory. Notice that I didn't use the word prove. They're looking for data that supports their theory. Generally, do people look for data that disproves their theory? Not usually. It's just human nature. Can scientific theories change? Can you give me an example? <laughs> you just know that they do. Uh, Schrodinger's cat? Pardon me? No, no, no. Not you and your Schrodinger's cat. Can scientific theories change? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's fun to talk about. Everything changes, though. Like, you say, like, 50 years ago, 60 years ago, you used to say that, like, something was good for you. Yeah, and, and three, out of, three out of five doctors represent or uh, recommended this type of cigarette, right? Yeah, yeah. Good for you. yeah exactly. So, yeah, okay, that's a good, good enough uh, example. Even Gino, they thought there was more, that was, uh, that changed your physical appearance. Yeah. Now there's less. Like, but he said hypothesis. Do I have it here? No, I don't. He said hypothesis theory law. Pretty close. And he said it was rubbish. And you'll never forget that. Never. You never will because of that accent. Well, he threw his paper away. And he threw the paper and he says, rubbish. And you'll never forget that. And that's good because in the world, we have people that consistently said, and I don't mean to pick on Lucas here, but he said it. So we've been taught, though. And it's wrong. Why is he just wrong? Wrong, 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 wrong. I'll give you another example. My life is been No, I'll straighten you out. Like grade 10 science and like everything. Ah, that. I'm guessing what you heard and what were taught maybe were two different things. Just because you think that you were taught that doesn't necessarily mean the doubt that you were taught it. It's your interpretation of it, right? And you may have that preconceived notion already going in. You might have just sort of tuned out. I'm not saying you, but in general, right? Well, Watch this. Do you guys know who, who uh, Rick Perry is? It gets a little dry, it gets a little boring, but at the end of today, you should have a good understanding of the difference between models, laws, and theories. Let's go. I do. Does anyone else want a highlighter? Okay, here we go. Science is more than just a collection of facts and observations. Models, laws, theories, and evidence 
all play an important role in understanding the nature of science. A scientific model is, pause for effect, waiting for people to about to highlight, a scientific model is a conceptual representation, an idea in your head, that stands for and helps explain other things. So a model is something that helps explain other things. A model can be physical, a real thing. Can you give me an example of a physical model? The globe. Imagined in my brain, like the Bohr model. You guys know about the Bohr model in chemistry, right? Yes. That's a model. Or mathematical, numbers and formulas. In science, we develop models that have explanatory and predictive powers. They can explain things and they can predict what's going to happen. Like the model of the universe. And we test these models in the world around us. If our model predicts our observations, we accept the model as a valid description of our world. We don't prove it, we just say it appears to um, describe what we're seeing accurately. Not necessarily proven. However, if our model encounters discrepant events, anybody know what the word discrepant means? Different. Or a discrepant event is an event that doesn't match what we think was going to happen. What happens every morning as you look out to the east? The sun comes up. A discrepant event would be if you looked out to the east and the sun wasn't there, it was coming up in the south. That would be a discrepant event. That'd be weird. It's something that you wouldn't expect. Um, and fails to provide adequate explanations, we begin to modify our model or search for an entirely different model. Example, at one point they thought the world was flat. Some guy went out, I think it was Magellan, was it? Sailed all the way around the world and said, guess what? I didn't fall off the edge, it ain't flat. Right? Um, he encountered a discrepant event. Was it Magellan? No, it's, the gamma? it's different because Magellan, actually Magellan's thing was not true. It's not with the world, but it's how big the world Oh, was. yeah, I think you're right. Anyways, that's a good example, right? I may not be right about my example, but... Oh, yeah. A good example of a scientific model is the model of the solar system. At one time, it was thought that the sun revolved around the Earth, and this geocentric model of the universe was considered to be a true representation for many centuries. Everyone thought the Earth was at the center, and the sun revolved around it. The model encountered a discrepant event when the retrograde motion of the planets did not exactly fit the epicycles of the geocentric model. I suddenly started speaking Chinese. A lot, a lot of big words. Epicycles. Here's the Earth. When you watch, remember Sheldon talking about the planets? Why were they called planets? Because they wander, and I think it's Mars, as Mars goes around, it tends to do a little loop-de-loop. -loop. It backs up, retrograde motion. It doesn't follow a pure sort of path, like you would expect it to if it was revolving around the Earth. And scientists start thinking, hey, that doesn't make sense. Why is it doing that backup thing? And it turns out because the model was wrong. wrong. <laughs> exactly. When you put the sun at the center, and the Earth out here, and Mars out here, and you do the math, it starts to make sense. So they encounter a discrepant event, the epicycles and the retrograde motion, blah, blah, blah. All you need to know is that when the evidence says your model's not right, your model needs to change. That's what you need to know. All right. A new model, the Copernican Sun Center model, provided a simple explanation of the movement of the planets and it predicted the phases on Venus. What the heck does that mean? What are the phases of the moon? And I'm not talking like teenage phases. When they say it, and say it and when they see it, where it would be in the sky? Uh, Half moon. Half moon. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about quarter moons, <laughs> right? Half moons. <laughs> Right? A new moon. So the moon has phases. We see that. Venus, if you look through a telescope, Venus has phases as well. You see a half of Venus. You just can't see it with the naked eye. Okay? So the new Copernican model predicted phases on Venus. They invented telescopes. It turns out it was right. It had predictive powers. It must be on the right track. It must be right. Third paragraph. Observations can be used to test models, both externally or by thought experiments, as we rethink and apply our model to new and sometimes discrepant situations. 
our observations can lead us to identify regularities and patterns in nature. He says in a deep, like, newscaster voice, because we call these regularities and patterns scientific laws. A scientific law is a regularity or pattern. Allow me to demonstrate. Here comes the tennis ball. What is the scientific law? What goes up must come down. It is a regularity. Have you ever thrown a tennis ball up that it doesn't come down? I sure wish I had the powers of the force that I could make that tennis ball stay there. That would be a what? A discrepant event. Thank you. So that scientific law does not exist in space. Laws have certain restrictions. That the law of what goes up must come down is true on Earth, and it's only true if what goes up is that the not the escape speed for tennis balls from the surface of the Earth. Sixty-two kilometers per second is the escape speed from Earth. I don't have the arm speed. Mitch maybe, but not me. Yeah. So I think it's 62 or 32 kilometers per second. So what's like the fastest thing we can throw that tennis ball? Uh, throw it? Yeah, I'll try it. <laughs> throw it maybe 150 miles an hour. We're talking kilometers per second then. Fast. So, so that's wasn't that a theory that if you <laughs> make something move, it will not stop unless a force is actually Yes, an um, object of motion stays so in motion. The theory is space. That's why the yes. Earth is always the friction that stops. Yeah. We'll get to that. Okay. For example, a simple scientific law would be what goes up must come down. We can also deduce laws given a certain set of conditions. For example, if light is a wave, we can geometrically show that the ratio of the signs of the angles of incidence and reactions constant, blah, 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 blah. We often represent laws as mathematical relationships, like Snell's law, Ohm's law, Charles' law, Newton's law. You probably know about Newton's laws. Yeah. Is this copyright? Is this copyright? This, this actually came from the Manitoba curriculum. I did not write this. Contrary to popular belief, and that's what Kurt was talking about, laws are not absolute and are often constrained to certain conditions. Ohm's law is valid only for some materials, and our pressure laws are constrained by temperature. Even Newton's laws are valid only in inertial frames of reference. What they're saying is that laws are only true in certain situations. But they're it's just that most of our situations are here on Earth, that's what we assume to be normal. We must be very careful about how we use the term theory. Put a big star beside this paragraph. This is the key one here that Governor Perry is all messed up on. The very last one. Oh, wow. We skipped the one. No, we didn't. And I'm pausing here so that I make sure that you're all gathered at the right spot. We must be very careful how we use the term theory. In everyday usage, the word theory often refers to an idea that is not proven. Oh, it's just a theory. It's just my guess. Theory, in everyday use, kind of means what? Hypothesis in the scientific sense, right? If you say, well, it's just a hypothesis, you sound like a nerd. So what do people say? It's just a theory, because everyone understands that, and you're not as nerd-like. Unfortunately, it's wrong, and then you make yourself look stupid, like Robbie. <laughs> In everyday usage, the word theory often refers to an idea that is not proven. It's particularly true that some theories, like many cosmological theories, are speculative ideas and based on little evidence. The <laughs> word speculative is important. Thank you. Speculative. Anybody? Who's got a dictionary on their phone? Speculative. Guess. To waste a battery? Pardon me? No, it's not specific. Guess. If you speculate in the stock market, you're taking a bit of a risk. Yes. Speculative means, in this sense, it means based on little evidence. It's For now, it's just kind of an educated guess. Based on little evidence. Speculative just means there's not a lot of evidence to support it. 
Okay? And some theories are like that. They're brand new. There hasn't been a lot of studies yet. Additionally, children often hold simple or naive theories about why things flow to why the sky is blue. Hypotheses or proposed solutions are also often speculative, and we often seek to build support for them through predictions and observations. So really, a theory is a hypothesis, right? Oh and then you gather evidence. But does it then become a law? No, it does not. <laughs> Uh, other, other theories, however, other theories like theories of radiation, metabolism, chemical bonding, have considerable evidential supports, i.e., or in other words, we tend to believe them. There's a lot of evidence that goes towards saying, yes, that, that theory is how, how it's happening. It is impossible to prove our theories for every possible case. Highlight that sentence. You cannot prove a theory. All, the only thing you can do is add evidence to support it, and that is different. You cannot prove theories because Josh might come along with some crazy idea that suddenly all it takes is one discrepant event and all that theory goes out the window. One. One um, discrepant event. Right? You cannot prove theories. It's impossible to prove our theories for every case, but robust theories explain a great deal and we sometimes literally bet our lives on. Therefore, scientific theories lie along a spectrum from speculative hypothesis to robust explanatory systems. In science education, I'm going, to, I'm going to summarize this for you. In science education, we often use early models of theories that are adequate for a less sophisticated understanding of the scientific concept. For example, Bohr's model of the atom explains all of the phenomena that one might examine in an introductory, introductory chemistry program. Basically, grade 9, 10, 11 chemistry, Bohr model all the way. Turns out it's not right. Grade 12, they teach a little bit more, right? And then university, you're going to learn a little bit more. What's, but what's the point? How can we teach you the complex theories? You wouldn't get it. We use it for teaching basic principles. It's good enough for what you need. It's like... So you're basically saying what we learned in grade 9 and 10 is like, forget half of that. It's just beginner chemistry. It's like having the trainer wheels on your bike. It's good enough for little kids, right? It's buying. It's like buying <coughs> baby shoes. Do they? Do you buy two hundred dollar Nikes for your infant? Yeah. Some people do. Most people yeah. don't because in three weeks they need another pair. It's good enough for now. Okay. This I need you to write down. Oh. I already got that. I need you to write this down. Somewhere where you can find room. No. A little leader, actually. Okay. Theories lie on a spectrum. I know, Nate. It's hard to sit and listen for this long. No, no, no. Where do you, where do you write it down? Wherever you want, man. The bottom of that page. There's a little bit of room at the top of this page, at the very bottom, okay. on your hand, on a separate sheet, sheet of paper. Get, get gauge to write on your head. I don't care. But you need to know this. Theories lie on a spectrum that ranges from speculative, which is based on little evidence, to robust, which is based on lots of evidence. As, as you do more and more experiments, the, high, the, the theory becomes more robust. Okay. Now go back to what Governor Perry was saying when he said, oh, it's just a theory. Hasn't been proven yet. What is he, what really should he be saying? He should be saying, oh, it's just a speculative theory. There isn't a lot of evidence for it. <coughs> but as more and more evidence exists, it should be moving that way, right? Now, no, he wasn't listening to Grey Lab Physics. The whole idea of global 
warming, climate change, it is all, there's a lot of controversy, right? Reports are coming out every day. One report, 99% of scientists think it's like this. And then it turns out, oh, there was some fake data there, right? It got, like, way colder this winter. Than, it's probably one of the coldest winters in, like... Absolutely. But know. does that mean, that is a dis what we might think is a discrepant event, but does that mean that it's global warming? What does that mean? Correct. Everywhere. Everywhere. If you look, in fact, I, meant, I made a point of this, because on Facebook, this... Past Christmas, past uh, winter, there was at least two or three of my contacts that said, oh, global warming, right? Thanks a lot. Minus 44. I can show you some of that, right? I found out the temperature in Melbourne, Australia, 48 degrees, positive. Warmer than it was colder here, like in that relative scale, right? Just because it's cold here doesn't mean that it's not. Hotter. There was like severe drought. Wildfires, it was crazy hot in Australia. Yeah, Did we have that this summer? No. <clears throat> One time, right? People look out and they see the weather. They don't see the climate. You guys know the difference between weather and climate, don't you? Right? It's like, it's like the trend. Yeah, the trend, right? And the overall trend, my friend, is just because it's cold one time doesn't mean that it's not overall going up. You have to look at the big picture. Right? Lots of controversy. I tend to lie on the side of, let's look at the science here, and I tend to believe it because I get all this stuff too. Well, wasn't there a thing that uh, yeah, 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 yeah. look at this global warming stuff? And you said there's a the greenhouse gas at that point. Which part, I know, of course, like volcanic gas or something like that. Also, CO2. Yeah. But the thing is, they have a different carbon, like carbon content in a different. There's a different case. There's lots of different things, right? And now, there's two things. This different carbon from our lead gasoline. Do you have a better understanding of model, law, and theory? Do you understand what theory is? Do you understand the models change? I think I've covered all those, right? Let me just zip through the last little bit here, and then I promise I'll try and be quiet. we got about 20 minutes left. I'll try to entertain you a little bit more at the end. A little less theory, a little bit more fun. Hang on, hang on. Give me about five more minutes, you guys, to get through this, okay? I know it's a long, it's a long, uh, long little lesson. I know it's a lot of sitting, but there's really no other way for you to go through. While it's important that our understanding of the nature of science is embedded in the context that the world is rational, can be understood, we never really know if we've achieved the most rational explanation. In science, the truth is elusive, but our beliefs must extend far beyond individual opinions. In science, we insist on an evidential argument. There must be evidence in science. You can't just say, I think. Okay? One of the main questions scientists are concerned with is the relationship between theory and evidence. It's not unusual in science education to make a knowledge claim in the form of, I know that. For example, while discussing health with your doctor, she might say that lowering cholesterol level lowers one risk of heart disease. To further the claim, support is found for the knowledge claim. We call this support evidence. The nature of the evidence presented will depend on the background knowledge of the knowledge claimer, in this case the doctor. For example, she might stress the statistical evidence or discuss the latest hypothesis of the underlying mechanism that relates to cholesterol level and plate formation. And the general public would say, I don't know what he's talking about. Or, of course, one might simply quote a recognized authority like the Department of Health and not attempt to formulate an argument at all. If I'm a doctor, I'm going to try to explain it to my patient in everyday language. Get your cholesterol down. It's bad for you. Okay. Since the background knowledge of the claimer and the intended no uh, audience may be different, evidential argument must be given that makes sense to the audience. Talk to the person that you're talking to. Make them understand. Blah, 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 blah. Done. That's all I heard. That's all you heard the whole time? I disagree, Lucas. I think if I asked you what the difference between a model law and a theory is, I think you would know now. Let's quickly summarize, shall we? A model is what? A representation of something that we can't see. It's a way of describing it. What's a law? <coughs> something that happens in nature. Something There's two kinds of laws, right? There's this kind of law, and then there's the, when it's a red light, you should stop law. This is the what will happen. That kind is the what you should do. 
You could still get, not do it, but, you know, so so, we'll just follow we'll get away. What about a theory? What is a theory? I'm going to ask that question of you. What is a theory? What do I expect back? The theory comes down to spectrum, speculative you, theory. Which yes, you would say something like, there are, a theory lies on a spectrum from speculative where there's little evidence <coughs> to robust where there's lots of evidence. Never ever use the word just a theory. Okay? If you want to sound nerd-like and say, well, that's just a hypothesis, you can think of me. Okay? You can blame it on me if you want, but never ever say it's just a theory. It's wrong. Well, can you just say just a speculation? You could say that, yeah, speculation. Okay, if you want to read more about this, yeah, right, whatever we said it, there's another article there. There's a few questions there to help tie your thoughts together if you're really interested. Let me tell you an interesting story. There's only a few minutes left here. The story of clever hands and the law of parsimony. Not all explanations. It's here. The horse one. I will not talk like this most periods, I promise. This is just introductory stuff that i got to get through. I like it. I promise. I don't know if you Fair enough. Let me tell you about the story of clever hands. All explanations for a knowledge claim are created equal. Some explanations involve more details and make more assumptions than others. Assume you are confronted by two explanations for the same phenomenon. <coughs> Both explanations seem equally plausible. Who knows what the word plausible means? Possible. It's basically possible. Which one would you select? The one that involved numerous assumptions and details or the one that involved fewer assumptions and details? Numerous. Either way, fewer. If common sense tells you to select the explanation that makes the fewest assumptions, <coughs> then you already have a good understanding of the law of parsimony. Here is an old but excellent example of the law of parsimony. In the early 1900s, Mr. Wilhelm von Ostein, a retired mathematics teacher, owned a remarkable horse named Clever Hands. Hands became world famous because he could apparently solve mathematical problems that involved decimals and fractions, tell time, read, among other remarkable abilities. Pretty smart horse. For example, someone, his trainer as well as strangers, might ask Hands what 7 divided by 4 equals. Hands would tap the answer out with his hoop and receive a treat when he was correct, which was well over 90% of the time. A committee that included the noted German psychologist Karl Stumpf was appointed by the German government to study the phenomenal horse, prove that his so-called abilities were nothing but a hoax. The committee completed their task and reported that although they were unable to prove Hans was receiving intentional cues, they remained unconvinced that he was able to solve such mathematical problems and complete the remarkable fleets by using his cognitive processes, otherwise, in other words, his small little horse brain. Stumpf's assistant, Oskar Fuchs, Nice name. Funst decided to continue investigating the phenomenal horse. Funst conducted several experiments and concluded that when Hans could see the person asking the questions, he was able to supply the correct answer. If Hans could not see the person asking the question, then his performance fell to near zero levels. In other words, he never got the answer right. He just kept stomping his foot looking for a treat. Funst was faced with two alternate explanations for the horse's abilities. Either Hans understood the questions and when able to use his brain, but only when he was able to see the questioner to solve the problems. Or the person asking the question was somehow inadvertently cueing the horse or telling the horse when to stop tapping his foot at the correct moment. And why is Dick Ramping got his earbud in his ear? Oh, that's a good question. Applying the law of parsimony, Funks chose the latter explanation and persisted in, it, persisted in his investigations. He finally determined that almost everyone who asked questions of hands made a minute upward movement of their head when the correct answer was reached. They'd go, like, look at the horse, and when he got, like, right, they'd give him a little nod, say, yeah, you're right, the horse would stop. He learned that when the person started doing this, he was close. Still a pretty smart horse, but he couldn't do much. The horse used this cue to stop tapping and receive his treat, i.e., this is an instant of positive reinforcement. So what is the law of parsimony? If you had to describe it yourself, parsimony. Anyone? I'll put it in simple words. Simple is likely right. In fancy words, the explanation that has the least number of assumptions is likely right. What was the least number of assumptions here, right? Like, there's no way this horse is doing math. And it doesn't make any sense just because the horse could see the person 
that it would be truth. The simple explanation is quite often the correct one. Let's go back to the geocentric models here. This is a crazy. There was all sorts of guys did like crazy math trying to come up with an explanation for this. But as soon as they put the sun at the center, it all became simple. Once again, the law of parsimony, the simplest explanation is most likely correct. Go. The last one. Last page, I promise. Done. Bayesian thinking. You're going to have to think here for a second. The first involves the statistician Abraham Wall, who was asked to determine where to add a limited amount of armor plating on bombers to protect them against anti-aircraft fire. When a plane returned from a mission, the Air Force would record the location of the bullet holes so that there was plenty of guys. So they set the planes out, they came back, there was lots of holes in the planes, and they measured where they were, and where did they put the armor? Did they put it where all the holes were? No. Why not? Bingo. The automatic response is, oh, that's where all the getting shot, let's put the armor there. Uh-uh. The planes that were shot there came back. The ones that were shot elsewhere didn't come back. Where should you put the armor? Where the holes weren't. Does that make sense? Why put the armor in no holes? I mean, the planes ain't coming back. They had. They don't shoot there though. They only had. You got to be careful. Your data. They only had data on the planes that came back. Why study the planes that come back? Study the planes that don't come back. How are you going to study them and they come back? Exactly. So you have to do the opposite. I'll give you another one. A second story relates to placing anti-aircraft guns in gunnery crews aboard merchant ships to protect them against enemy bombers. So in the war, they would send commercial ships out with, um, with cargo on it, and they would put anti-aircraft guns and crews on them to protect them from bombs. Since both the weapons and crew training were in scarce supply, a handful of vessels were equipped to test the idea for several weeks. At the end of the trial period, the gunnery crews were asked how many planes they'd shot down, and the answer, unfortunately, was absolutely none. Big waste of money, take them off the boats, right? Is that what you should do? No. Why not? The entire plane was about to be scrapped when someone thought to ask a different question. How many planes did you have? Exactly. None. What did the gunnery crews do? They scared off the bombers. It's like having a big dog house in your yard without a dog. It's like having a fake video camera without having the thing in behind the recorder, right? Same idea. Don't always go by your first thought. I will finish up with the Monty Hall story. 